Um, this morning, if you would join with me in the book of Genesis, we are now in chapter 2, all the way at the beginning of your Bibles. And today we'll be studying the events of chapter 2, and you will be introduced to a, a literary device called telescoping. For all of you serious academics, you can talk to me later and see if you've heard that before. We also see that the Bible has things to say about the Garden of Eden and the first two humans ever created, Adam and Eve. I'd like to actually read starting in chapter 2 and starting in verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet been sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and it became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gion, and it flows from the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and not ashamed. <coughs> father, I ask that you would guide the words this morning, that you would guide our hearts and our minds as we ponder this creation event and that we wouldn't be led astray by our own thoughts but that we would listen carefully to what you have to say. Teach us that we might grow in wisdom and grow in truth in Jesus name. Amen. If you look at the beginning there, verse 4, this is the account. Notice those uh, four words I mentioned previously may denote a historical account that Moses had access to as God directed him to put to paper the genesis of all things. If you used a Bible app or if you went to your computer and typed in, particularly in a Bible app, this is the account, just those four words, it would pull up at least ten of those in the book of Genesis. And then it would be followed by what is the account. If Genesis 1 is the creation of all things in a grand scope, Genesis 2 is the telescope 
the looking more deeply into one particular creation moment, that of man and woman. So if you move now from verse 4 to 5 and 6, it talks about the shrubs of the field and a mist. We saw previously in chapter 1 that God, when he created, also created the atmosphere around the earth, the layers of the atmosphere. And it may well be that in the original creation, not only were those layers thicker, thus able to keep out more of the sun's radiation, it may also have been enough to keep the fluctuations in temperature low enough that the hydrological cycle was not put into motion. There wasn't enough heat, enough evaporation, and then enough cooling to make rain fall. In either case, God designed it in such a way that a mist was enough rising every morning to water all the plants. This will change with Noah, and it will be much more similar to what we have today. Starting in verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. This does, by the way, follow the creation sequence that is found in chapter 1. You might have to go revisit that particular uh, sermon if you don't remember it, but it does follow where the plants are created on day 3 while the humans were created on day 6. So... I thought we would read part of that again, just to get refamiliarized. Starting uh, on verse 26 of chapter 1, you can just look over there. God said, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you and to every animal of the earth and every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that all he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Just to recap. So now we are looking more deeply into strictly the account of man and woman. Look at verse 7 again. God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils. It's an important detail because I'm well aware that in the non-Christian world, they like to say that you and I, as humans, are simply a part of the entire animal kingdom. Right? It's very common. We're part, it's, it's part of scientific nomenclature. That's how we're... Uh, uh, understood in our kinds. But that's because Darwin imagined that, not because science says it or proves it. He imagined it that we humans evolved by chance mutations from some lower animals to what we are today. Well, in case some of us have forgotten, science only remains science when it can test its theories and repeat its results. That is actually science. Right? You go to a basic science class, they'll tell you that. I have to have a theory, I have to test it, and then those results I have to reproduce the same way. Or else it's not science, it's imagination. Well, I'm sorry, science cannot test the beginning of man. Science cannot test the beginning of life. In fact, science itself cannot test and show you that man evolved from anything else but man. It cannot do that scientifically. So if you're going to hold to a theory, why don't you hold to the theory that God gives, which is not a theory, but the truth? Why don't you hold to what he says, since he's the one that knows all things and started all things? Now, if we look at our account here, there are similarities in how God created the animals and how God created man. 
in both cases, God used the raw materials that he created from the beginning, right? The, the minerals, the dust, as he calls it. And he made from that living things. It says that in your text. And this is why, by the way, God will say in Genesis 3.19, which is just up the way, and we often quote in part at funerals, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So if you've ever been to a funeral and you wondered why do they say that, because it's in the Bible, because it's God affirming this is where you ultimately will end up until he comes again. Well, God informs us in Genesis that he made us from those basic elements. And then God blew life into us. He created life. He made life in the animals also, but there is a dramatic difference I'd like to highlight for us right here. In verse 7, in the Hebrew, it says God breathed life into man and he became a living soul or spirit. The two are slightly interchangeable. He didn't just become life, he became a living soul. And so in the book of Job 33.4, we also read, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. It's reiterated elsewhere in the Bible. That's how we establish the truth of it. You and I, as humans, are completely distinct from the rest of creation. We are not the same thing as creation. We are not the same thing as the animals. We're certainly not plants. That's why Genesis 1, 26 and 27, I read earlier, states that we are made in God's image. That's highly unique to the created world. We alone, of everything that's been created, has been made in some fashion in God's very image. We are sentient beings. I think I used that word last time and I said you might have to look that up. Sentient beings, it means we are self-aware. We ponder things. We have abstract thoughts. We imagine things. We think about moral decisions. We're creative. We invent. And we act not on base instincts, but on God's superior moral law. That's what we act upon. It's inside of us. And there's a great example. This is from the world of philosophy. Because some will say, again, if you're not a Christian, you'll say, well, look, we're just like animals. Animals have base instincts. That's what they act upon. Okay. Except it's not true for humans. Here's the great example. As a human, you're walking down the street and a fire starts in a building. And you can hear a small child and they're screaming. Your base instinct, if you're an animal, says run away from the fire. But we're not animals. Our moral instinct says go and save. You see the difference? I see the difference. <laughs> When God gives the Hebrews his commandments in the Bible, what they ought to live by, he says in Deuteronomy 6, 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. It's part of us. In fact, it's who we are. Our soul, like our mind, is who we are as a person. It's not the body, right? Because... If I lose an arm, if I lose both, both arms, I'm still actually me. It's not my arms that make me me. So we have a soul. And that may not seem so amazing to you this morning. Or maybe you just haven't thought about it. But that's unique in God's creation. We didn't evolve to have a soul. And we're not animals. God created us distinct. You can see it in the creation account. Distinct. From the animal creation. A separate event. And then he breathes his own life. His spirit into us. Thereby giving us our spirit. And by the way. It's this spiritual part of you. That actually comes into relationship with God. It's not your body. 
It's your spirit that communes with God. Well, why is that so? Because what is God? God is spirit. That's what he is. Jesus said this himself in the Gospel of John 4, verse 24. He says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, I think Jesus knew. And the other problem is we must be very careful not to make God into our image. It's very easy to do, to suddenly begin thinking God must look like me. He must have legs and arms and he must move like we move and think like we think. That's not the way to look at this. We in some part are made in his image. His image, not the other way around. Let me add a final distinction from animals. Jesus came to pronounce the good news to mankind, right? He came to earth. He lived amongst us. He pronounced the good news, the gospel that would free us from sin. He came. He died for our sins. He was raised to life so that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life with him. Jesus did not come and preach the gospel to animals or plants or rocks. And he did not die for animals, plants, or rocks. But we'll come back to the humans versus animals in just a second. I want to move on. <laughs> I don't, by the way, I don't have anything against animals, just so you know. I've had lots of dogs. I've had pets, okay? But I, I'm quite adamant that I am not part of the animal kingdom, okay? Which is why God says to Adam and Eve, look, your job is to rule over this because you're separate from it. This is your domain to rule. Verses 8 and 9 the Lord God planted a garden towards the east of Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. And look, he says, on the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. God creates this entire universe in chapter 1, and then he plants this very special garden just for man to live in. I say man in the generic mankind sense, right? All the food Adam needed, all the plants there were attractive. Then in verse 9, two specific trees are mentioned. All right? If you have your Bible, two trees are mentioned. Tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. But you're actually going to have to come next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to know more about those specific trees. <laughs> Because the reality of those trees comes into play next week. I'm sorry, I have to do that. <laughs> I'm taking this in order. Plus, that makes you come back next week. So, if you want to learn about that, and it is fascinating, you should come learn. Just read it for yourselves, but ultimately, I will be looking at that in detail next week. Verses 10 through 14, I am not going to reread the river flowing out and the various rivers. Some people spend a lifetime, even scholars will spend a lifetime on these four verses, 10 through 14, trying to decipher these places, vainly hoping, I think, to discover where this gold might be, this like Garden of Eden, El Dorado. But it's really vain because, for two reasons, okay? Number one, at the end of chapter three, even if you put on your Indiana Jones hat and found it, there's an angel with a sword that will end your days upon finding it. That's chapter 3. I'm not making this up. But the bigger reality is that when Noah and the flood are on the scene in chapters 6 through 9, the entire earth is underwater. Mountains shift. All of the geology changes. You would never ever find these features. They're gone. They're erased and rewritten after the flood. So I wouldn't waste a whole lot of time on those. But verses 10 through 14 do show you, I think, God's extravagant care for Adam and later Eve. Planting such a garden specific for them with beauty and bounty. God has this deep care for his creation. And let me add... 
This is the same God who is still looking down, still reaching out his hand to you and I. The same God who hasn't changed, still reaching out, looking to reestablish that initial connection. And that is really the story of the whole Bible, if you're curious. God created everything perfectly. Sin entered the world. You'll see chapter 3. And then the rest of the account is God reaching back out to mankind. Finally, in the New Testament with Jesus Christ, creating the only bridge back to that original perfection. Which we can freely take and accept now while we await his return. There is a return. There, and that is a good thing. I just read, in the, just read to the, recently this week that the scientists have figured out that the earth is slowing down. I thought they had figured that out 30 or 40 years ago, but it made the news again. The <laughs> rotation of the earth is slowing down. Go figure. Everything has an end. <laughs> well, verse 15, we'll, we'll just keep moving. Then Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. I like this because it's a detail that says... Adam didn't just wander in to this special place by chance. No, this was part of God's plan. He made this. Adam, this is for you. And Adam and Eve later were given work to do. Do you see that in verse 15? Mm -hmm. So in our modern world, the idea of work is a different thing than when Earl was younger <coughs> or Gordon. Work back then was established. This is what you're going to do. Today, it's a little different. So, I want you to see that it started at the beginning. Verse 15, God gave them a task. You see, all the muscles and the brain cells and the creativity that God gave you are for a purpose. You wouldn't need any of that to sit on a couch. But you do need that to work. So, they began to tend this garden. And then 16 and 17, the Lord commanded the man saying, from the tree of the garden you may, from all the trees you may freely eat, but not from one particular tree. Which I know, I told you I was going to talk about next week. In the midst of God's perfect creation comes a rule. One single rule. How do you like that? Now some of you may be like, well, why was there a rule? Wouldn't everything have been better if there were no rules? In fact, wasn't that a temptation that God put there? Why would he do that? Why couldn't he just make it with no rules and perfect? Well, first of all, let me tell you one thing. When God gives the command to Adam, this is not a command he could have given to the animals or the plants. Right? Because it would take a rational thinking human to understand the command and to decide what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Right. You can command your animals all day long about something as complex as, see that tree over there? That's the one you can't touch. But that tree you can. And they will stare at you and go on their merry way. Okay. <laughs> so why did God place that there? The fact that you might ask yourself these questions once again prove that God endowed you with a rational mind. You see things and you question and you think and you ponder. This again is how we are in fact made in his image. And God, I think, created us in some likeness to himself because he wanted to have a meaningful relationship with us. He needed something that was able to have a relationship with him. He didn't make us as robots that just say yes and no on command, push a button, yes. That's not a relationship. And love, which is the basis of everything, God is love, can never be forced and remain love. You can't. You cannot coerce love. Then it becomes something else. Well, if you can't coerce love, and God is looking for a loving relationship with his creation, specifically us, that would require a free will, 
It would require the ability of the human being to hear what God says and decide yes or no. And that is the dilemma. In order to have the free will to decide yes, you also have the free will to decide no. So it isn't the tree that caused the yes or the no. Each of us today has the same God-given ability to choose who we will serve. Each one of us. But I'm going to encourage you once more to come back next Sunday <laughs> to see what the consequences are of rebelling against God's commands. Don't eat from that tree. Because there are consequences. We know this in life. Every choice we make has some sort of a consequence. Sometimes multiple consequences. Verses 18 through 20, we, we keep moving here. And the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. And by the way, he reiterates that. In verse 20, there was not a suitable helper found for him. Verse 18, no suitable helper. Twice. Adam starts his job of tending the garden and God brings all the animals before him. That's what it says. And he gives them names. Now you may wonder, how could Adam possibly name every animal on earth? Again, that's part of your skeptical nature, right? That's, God made us this way. I wonder that. How could, it, how could that be? That's not even possible, right? It's too many animals. Well, maybe if you look at it one way, but let me help you to see another way. So first of all, Adam and Eve, when they were created, were the apex of humanity. Absolute perfection of humanity. So whatever your mind conjures up, whether it's some Greek athlete, right? Some crossfitter looking person, along with all the academic prowess of a scholar, that's Adam and Eve. The perfection. That means their brains were working so much faster than ours, so much better than ours. Their bodies were far, far superior to ours. So already Adam had a huge advantage over us. But another way to see this is, did Adam actually have to name every slight variation of every animal kind? Or did he simply need, okay, bring me the head of the canines here Probably a wolf-looking creature. All right, you are, I call you wolf, canine. And then, okay, I don't need all the little cats. I just need the main cat. Maybe it's a saber tooth. He says, you know what? I call you this, and the rest of you are all felines. That also works. It doesn't say how it was done, but he did it. So it's just a way to think about this. But in the process of doing that, suddenly Adam realizes, wait a minute, there's all these amazing animals and they all have mates and pairs, except for me. And he realizes that nothing in the animal kingdom is the right thing for him. God knew that. No animal could think the thoughts that Adam had. No animal could communicate like he could or understand or empathize with his life. No animal could do that. It doesn't matter that dogs are really friendly and they lick you all the time. They can't do that, can they? They can't. You know that. You can't talk to them and they can't respond and empathize with what you're going through. They cannot. So we'll move on. We'll get to the actual what's going to happen here. Verses 21 and 22. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And as he slept, and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh. Now, there are all these jokes about you. Did you realize men have one less rib? Did you ever know that? Have you ever looked at a skeleton? They don't have one less rib. Uh, I was just tricking you. <laughs> as a kid, that's what somebody told me. <laughs> so. No, there's no less rib. In fact, in the Hebrew, if you really study it, it doesn't say the word rib. Now, it doesn't mean your translation's bad. 
It's just the way of understanding it. In the Hebrew, it says God took from the side of Adam. More generically, from the side, which I think answers or explains why Adam says, Aha, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Not just, here's a piece of my bone. This is actually part of me in the fullest sense. And then I thought, okay, God put him to sleep. This was, okay, this is the first anesthetic before surgery, right? But that's just a human way of seeing it today. I actually think, no. By putting Adam to sleep, God ensured that Adam was not privy to that creation moment for Eve. Meaning they would remain equal. Adam didn't get to be above and look down upon while she was created. That was only God that could do that. God said, no, you go to sleep. I will take from you and make for you. So God does that. In verse 23, this is why Adam exclaims, I think, yes. Aha. By the way, you can't see it. You'd have to look at different translations and the original, but it's an ex exclamation on his part. It's like, there it is. There is my other half, as it were, because from the side, right? My other half. So I guess you can say that. And this is the very real sense in which God did not create two separate humans. And this is very contrary to evolution. I'm here to tell you, I spent way too much time looking at this stuff. In the evolutionary world, not only do they say that the first hominid, the first human, was distinct from the first female hominid, human. Like they, they didn't come together, they came from separate places. And thankfully, according to evolution, luckily they met. See, these are two separate events in evolution. But that's not how it actually came to be, did it? No, because the odds, well, let me just say here, the odds of one ape one day turning into a man like we are today, and then some other place on the globe, a female doing the same thing, and then, right, planes, trains, and automobiles, they suddenly meet one day, it's not <laughs> actually possible. So once again, it's an untestable imagination. No, God did it this particular way, I think, for a very, very good reason. Because man and woman are actually of the same substance. The very same substance. <laughs> and there is nothing closer to man than a woman. Because of that. Nothing closer. They are perfectly matched, men and women, because God made it from one. Nothing else is like that. God designed men and women then for each other. Both created in his image. Both loved by God. Both with a free will and both with a spirit and a soul breathed in by God. Both are required to actually fulfill God's institution of marriage and family. He couldn't have said, look, I need you to multiply and fill the earth if there weren't two, man and woman. So, for instance, and this has already gotten me into trouble at somebody's wedding, but I'm a, <laughs> it's pure coincidence. My notes are written long before I know anybody's coming today. <laughs> Relationships of two men or two women stand in opposition to God's design. Because the design is here in the beginning. And such unions are even called sinful in the Bible in several places. Even a one-parent household is a flawed model according to God's design. Because God's design intends not simply... The blending of the genetic code and the chromosomes, which you have separate in men and women. But the balance of male and female traits creates that ideal family unit. It is that balance that God understood. So, for instance, men, and I'm looking at all the guys here this morning. Yeah, that's right. 
Men should work the hardest. That's what I say. You and I should sweat the most. We should get bruised and banged up the most as we build up the household. And when something goes bump in the night, men, that's you. You go look to see what that is. You protect the house. That's your job. Okay? That's part of how God made you. Women have their own God-given abilities. They excel at raising children when men don't. Only women can nurse newborns, at least until the invention of the bottle. <coughs> women have a much greater gentleness and patience than most men, especially towards slow learning children. Women make homes homey and they make homes organized. And they keep schedules for us and they make sure that hospitality exists in the home and people come to visit it's not the men that do that it's the women women complement the men and together they create life for family it does take both in verse 23 there's an interesting wordplay in the hebrew and some of you already know this and in English, we have it, the man said, this is, you know, a bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, right? In the word woman, you see the word man, right? Woe man, right? Well, in the Hebrew, it's the same thing. Man is ish, I-S-H, woman is isha. Interesting, it's the same idea, because one really comes from the other. They are so closely interconnected. God made men and women with a polarity of traits and abilities, but also a sameness that can blend into a truly beautiful union. That's why he made us this way. And I will tell you, the subtle lies of Satan and the vain imagination of sinful people keep telling us to confuse the genders. They keep telling us that it's okay to do it a different way. And they will keep telling us that. That somehow the two of the same also works. But you and I both know it doesn't work the same. I have experience with that in extended family. And I can tell you that no matter what two same genders you put together, one of them will always act like a male and one of them will always act more like a female. They do. Why? Because that's what God has made us to be in relationships like that. That's, you just see it. I'm sorry. That means one person's pretending more than the other. We don't need to pretend. God already made us male and female. And even the challenge is that for raising up children in the family, you need both of those polarities. You need both what man is and what woman is to create the perfect family life. Well, twice in this chapter, we find that until Eve was created, there was no suitable complement to him as an equal. No suitable complement. Yes, Eve was made a helpmate for Adam. If you're in the King James, a helpmeet. Helpmate. No suitable helper. And that sets the precedent for all future uh, marital relationships. But men here, don't ever get in your head that God created a servant for you. Because that's not in the text. It's not. Not only is it not in the text, women are not subordinate in substance. You can see clearly the same substance. They are not less in value towards God. They're not less in God's love. They're not less able in this world. You all know CEOs who are women. There are plenty of physicists who are women and academic. So that's not it. But as soon as one gender sees the other as subordinate, somehow lesser, then I can assure you pride has replaced love. 
works both ways. If you see yourself, well, I am this and they are that, then that is not love. Don't even try to have a relationship because you have let pride get in the way of love. <clears throat> when either the man or the woman tries to dominate the other, love fails. It will no longer be harmony in the household. And women don't need to become tough like men. And men certainly don't need to get soft and perfumey like women. <laughs> Romans 12 verse 9 tells Christians, and you'll see that it works together here. Romans 12 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low disposition. Do not be conceited. Well, if you want more study on men and women, I would encourage you to look up the two last sermons I did in Colossians. They are on the internet. Uh, I think they're called Christian Relationships. And there they more specifically address men and women in marriage, but I hope you can see how God created us. The entire universe is finely tuned for life. The, the, I'm sorry, the earth, finely tuned for life, specifically our life. And then God took a very special interest in man and woman. It wasn't enough that he created the universe. Made the garden, filled it with beautiful th things, gave us a purpose and a work to do. And although sin does show up in chapter 3... God has not stopped seeking that holy relationship with us. Even sending Jesus to pay the price. But you and I will have to turn from our self-seeking life. From our own pride to reestablish that connection with Christ. And when we do that, when you and I give that connection back to the Lord... Reestablish it, then we can say as believers what the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3, 1 to 3, and that's what we will end with. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify himself just as he is pure. And we ponder this this week, God's amazing love for us. Amen.